Okay, tonight's presentation will be Space Stations, Past, Present, and Future by James Joe Mapper. Since humans first gazed toward the heavens, they have dreamed of one day living in space. James will highlight several of the space stations of fact and fiction, from the Brick Moon, written by American writer Edward Everett Hale in 1869, to the Soviet military stations, through the Lunar Gateway plan for this decade and beyond. A dedicated and active NASA solar system ambassador, James Joel Knapper, has been hooked on NASA and space exploration since grade school. Joel earned a Bachelor of Science degree in English education from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Joel is an officer of his local amateur astronomy group, the Kankakee Area Stargazers, where he presents monthly updates on NASA programs. He also hosts many other NASA events in the Chicago area. Joel lives in Bourbonnet, Illinois. Please welcome James Joel Knapper. Kurt. First, let me explain my name. This is James Joel. And Joel. I go by, my. everyone calls me Joel. That's my middle name. So you can call me James or you can call me Joel or whatever. So, Well, thank you for inviting me to talk uh, about a topic I love to talk about, uh, space stations. Uh, so I learned a lot putting this presentation together for you so hopefully you'll you'll learn uh, a little bit too some things you didn't know uh, I will say I'm from uh, the Kankakee area I live in Bourbonnais and uh, the the group that I'm affiliated with is the Kankakee area stargazers and so like you right now we don't have well you you're kind of misplaced right now right now we usually use all of that for our meetings and they are looking for a planetarium director so while they're looking we're not really using that, uh, using that space right now. But uh, it's nice to see you all. I, I haven't been here live in a few years. So without any further ado, we'll talk about uh, space stations. Please, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. So what we'll cover today is what is a space station? Early space stations, the 1960s, which was really military stations, 1970s, the Salyut and the Skylab, the 1980s, which was Mir, 2000s, which is the International Space Station, 2010s, the Tiangong Chinese stations, and we'll talk a little bit about the 2020s, the Lunar Gateway and some of the commercial space stations that are planned. So what is a space station? It's an artificial structure in space designed for humans to live and work, has no major propulsion system, so you, you, you have some limited ability to move, but not much, no landing capability, so no landing anywhere, provide a longer time to run experiments, you can create new materials, new medicines, that's the hope of all the research on space station, and study the long-term uh, space light effects on the human body so that we can safely travel to uh, other planets and other worlds someday. So one of the earliest space stations was the Brick Moon. In 1869, Edward Hale wrote about a brick moon that would be up above in the sky and ships could use that for navigation. Now, of course, nowadays they use GPS, but it was a good idea except I don't think there would be palm trees uh, up there on the brick moon. And then Hermann Obereth, uh, a German um, physicist in the 20s, wrote a book, and he coined the phrase space stations for the first time. Uh, there you see Hermann and, uh, and uh, von Braun, the uh, creator of the Saturn V in this picture. They brought, uh, the military brought uh, those two over after uh, World War II. Von Braun uh, became famous uh, for Collier's Magazine and talking about building large space stations. Uh, the focus in, for Von Braun was uh, a station wheel shaped that created artificial gravity. There was concern about microgravity and uh, there are still ideas to have artificial gravity up in space, but right now we're using the microgravity uh, for experiments. So we get to the 1960s. Uh, that's uh, from 2001, <laughs> Space Odyssey, right? Their thought of where we would be in 2001, we're not quite there. But we had Project Gemini from 1964 mm -hmm. to 1966, 
where we launched two astronauts up into space. They learned how to dock two vehicles together, they learned to spacewalk, and one of the technologies that came out of this was the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, which was a military project to have a military space station. So what they would do, they would take the rocket and the, the, stage, the second stage, third stage of the rocket, they would make it a, a, a lab. There would be two astronauts in an expanded Gemini spacecraft who would be able to go through a hatch into the, uh, into the space station. So why would they want a military space station? Well, the thought was you could have military astronauts taking pictures over silos and things. All right, why not use, why not use uh, unmanned craft to do that? Well, sometimes when it would go over the, the orbit, those silos would be closed. But if you had, if you had astronauts aboard, they could film when, you were, when, the, when there weren't clouds, or they could film silos that didn't have, uh, didn't have a cover on it. That was the thinking, although there were a lot of concerns about putting in a, a, a life support system for, uh, for astronauts. But they actually started building this. Douglas Aircraft, who built the Gemini spacecraft, started building this lab. Uh, here's a little video of them showing, uh, showing the mirror system that, that they would use uh, to, to project the light into the cameras so that the astronauts would operate. Be nice to have a mirror like that for a telescope, I would say. <laughs> So they would use another spacecraft built like the Gemini. This is the Gemini B, which is actually at the Air Force Museum in Ohio. And the difference is it had a hatch, um, had a hatch built into the heat shield. So what they did is they took one of the Gemini spacecraft that had already flown and they refurbished it. They cut a hole in the heat shield for a hatch and they flew it again to see could it survive the heating with this hatch so the astronauts could climb through the hatch into the, in the, into the uh, laboratory, and it did, it did. So uh, you can see how cramped that Gemini spacecraft was for, for two astronauts. They actually put a little opening, separated the seats a little bit here, and the hatch was like out the back way, so. Uh, there were about 18 Air Force astronauts assigned to the Manned Orbiting Laboratory. And they were going to fly them every six months or so. They would spend about 30 days on this, on, this, uh, on this laboratory. So, you know, the United States, we weren't first on launching a satellite. We weren't first on putting an astronaut in space. We weren't first on doing a spacewalk. But we were going to be first on putting a space station up. So they actually did a test launch. There's that Gemini spacecraft that rode on top with that tested, testing uh, heat shield. It was going to go into polar orbit, a uh, launch from uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. But it didn't happen. None of this happened. So about a month before we first landed on the moon, the military said, we're going to cancel the program. There were a few reasons. One, uh, the, the war in Vietnam was costing quite a bit. Um, people started thinking about actually having humans running the cameras. It, the technology had advanced and we could actually do a lot of this unmanned. Um, and the camera system wasn't ready yet. So they, they had talked about, well, let's go ahead and fly them anyway. Because if you start a program, it's hard to cancel it uh, in Congress. But they didn't. They didn't fly it. And they said, okay, the, we have all these astronauts. If they're 35 years of age and younger, we'll send you to NASA. If you're o over 35, you, just, you can stay in the Air Force. And so seven of those astronauts went on to fly the space shuttle in the 80s. Uh, so what happened with that technology? Well, the Hexagon spy satellite looks awfully like the Manned Orbiting Laboratory. Uh, so this is an unmanned spy satellite declassified that basically took pictures and it would drop capsules. It would carry several capsules with it. So as it ran out of film and used up all the film, 
it would drop the capsule and a plane would, it, the capsule would come in on a parachute and the plane would catch it. And so that's what they did. Um, the, um, the other thing, those mirrors that you saw getting ready, and I joked about having that for a telescope, they actually, uh, the military donated those mirrors to the Whipple Telescope in 1979. Uh, Hoppy, do you know what mountain that uh, Whipple telescope's on? Mount Hopkins. That's right. I'm glad you're here. I wanted you for that. So for about 10 years, uh, they used those military mirrors that they were going to use on the manned orbiting laboratory for the Whipple telescope. And now, now they have a different mirror. So we weren't number one. Russians, again, were number one on getting a space station up. So they launched... Uh, the Salyut series of space stations. This is a Salyut station with a uh, Soyuz, which they still fly today, to the space station, the International Space Station, uh, docked. So Salyut 1 was launched in 1971. Uh, at that time, you could only dock one vehicle. You could only spend 24, 25 days aboard. So they launched the Soyuz 10 crew, a crew of three, up to, to dock with the Salyut. And they soft docked, but they couldn't, they couldn't hard dock, and they couldn't enter the laboratory. So they were pretty unhappy, dejected about that, but they came back to Earth. And they worked on the hatch a little bit, and they launched the Soyuz 11 crew. They launched in June of 71 up to the Salyut. And they became, that's a picture as they got closer, they became the first crew to, to man a space station. They spent 23 days in orbit. But when they came back, they had a problem. Now the Soyuz has three sections. It has an orbiting module. When you get into orbit, you can live up here. They have the descent module. When you launch and you land, you're in this descent module that has the parachutes. Uh, and then they have a service module that has like rocket engines to, and, and power systems. They undock from the station okay, but as they're coming in to land, there's explosive charges that separate these sections so that you just have the descent module to come in through the atmosphere. The explosive bolts that separated the top section from where the crew was, fired at the same time. They weren't supposed to fire at the same time. They were redundant, so if there was a problem, you had another one that could, that could separate them. But they fired at the same time, and they jerked open a valve that is supposed to open uh, when they get in the atmosphere, to, to let the air from the atmosphere in. And so the problem was they couldn't find where this hole was, this valve was open, before they uh, ran out of air. So when they landed, uh, they didn't hear from them. They didn't hear from the crew, but they thought, oh, it's just a radio problem. But when they landed, they had, they had died. So the reason we know so much about this is because we later uh, had an Apollo Soyuz mission where we docked with the Soyuz, and we wanted to know what happened. We didn't, wanted to know that Soyuz was a good craft. So. The Russians did explain to us what happened with this. Um, so the Russians launched Salyut. They called them Salyut. If, if they were unsuccessful, sometimes they would call them Cosmos missions. They would call them Almaz if they were military stations. So just like the manned orbiting laboratory, they had some military stations to take pictures. But one interesting thing about the Almaz is they carried a gun. They were worried about us going up there and, and taking a look at what they were doing. So they actually carried a chain gun that was on the Tupolev Tu-22 bomber. Um, now, to their credit, they never fired it with people aboard. But at Almaz Station, after the last crew had left, they actually fired it. Because, you know, if you're firing it, the recoil is going to move everybody inside. Uh, and it actually fired, and they actually sent a, an old satellite up, it got close, and they fired and they destroyed it. So, uh, but they only did it once. They only did it one time. 
They had designs for the Almaz II, which would, which would have carried synthetic radar, uh, but they did not, they did not launch uh, that. They launched several other Salyut stations. Uh, Salyut 7 was the last one they launched from 1982 to 1986. But after the third crew left the station, they lost contact with the station and it started tumbling. So they didn't know what they were going to do. So they sent up a crew of two cosmonauts to the station to see if, number one, to see if they could dock. Because they had usually automatically docked at the station, but they figured the station was dead. There was no power, and, and they were right. So they sent a couple astro or cosmonauts up, up there. You could see them wearing their woolen hats because they, they, were, they managed to dock. And there was ice formed on the inside, and it was four degrees in, in the um, spacecraft. But after 10 days, they were able to get the power restored and, and get it back and operational. In fact, Salyut 7, the last flight to Salyut 7, they actually flew to Salyut 7, picked up some experiments, and then flew to the Mir space station. So the only time that we've ever flown to two space stations in orbit at the same time. But more about uh, Mir here in a minute. So the US was working on a space station called Skylab. Uh, it came out of the Apollo program. The Apollo program, of course, was the, the program to land astronauts on the moon. So we had a lot of equipment. We had a command module where the astronauts stayed, a service module that had the oxygen generators and, and the, um, uh, the power to, to go into orbit with an engine and communications. And you had a lunar module that landed on the moon. So you had this equipment, it's like, why, let's use this equipment for other things. So they had a program called the Apollo Applications Program. And it, the purpose was to take this equipment we had developed and do other things. There was proposals maybe to go out to Venus and loop around Venus and come back to Earth. Uh, the Apollo telescope mount where we would carry uh, solar telescopes in one of the bays and operate that and take pictures of the sun. Uh, here's another Apollo telescope mount using the lunar module the, um, the, where the astronauts actually would stay and you would have control panels for the telescope uh, in this lunar module. Um, then they decided on something they called the WET workshop, where they would launch not the moon rocket, but a Saturn 1B. It's a smaller Saturn rocket. They would fill it all with fuel, and the astronauts would get up there, and they would purge the fuel, and they would, they would bolt experiments in, and then they would dock and stay at, at a space station. Well, they decided, after canceling the last three Apollo landings, we had a Saturn V available all of a sudden. Actually, had three. And so they decided to go away from the wet workshop and go to what they called the dry workshop. The Saturn V that would take us to the moon had enough power to lift uh, a station fully outfitted with, uh, with uh, decks and experiments and sleeping quarters and food. Actually, it had an airlock module. It had what they called the multiple docking ad adapter, where we, they could have two spacecraft attached at the same time. And then this was the Apollo telescope mount, which was a sol set of solar telescopes that looked at the sun and took pictures of the sun. So they decided, we're going to launch Skylab. So they started working, converting this stage. So they took the last, the third stage of the Saturn V, made it a space station, and launched it with two wet stages. So this was the launch, May 14th of 73, the last flight of the Saturn V to lift Skylab, which is up here, up, up into space. About 60 seconds into the flight, they ran into some problems. Around the space station, they had designed a micrometeorite shield to protect against space dust and, and, and material hitting. So this shield would pop out in space just a few inches from the skin of the, of the station to help protect it. If something hit it, 
it would get slowed down and hopefully protect the station. Well, air rushed in to a couple of openings on, the, on this shield, and it ripped the shield off the station. When it did so, it ripped free the solar panels that were attached to the station. Now, one of the solar panels was held in place by a piece of metal. The other solar panel was just kind of hanging. The other thing that happened, this shield fell down the rocket and there's a charge that's supposed to separate an adapter that's around the second stage where the engines are and it cut that charge so that the adapter didn't come off. Now, it wasn't that the Saturn V couldn't lift it. Saturn V was very powerful. A lot of days now, if, if you can't separate the, um, you know, the top of the rocket, if you can't, if you can't separate the, um, the piece that protects the satellites, it can't carry it up into orbit. Saturn V could carry it in, up into orbit, but the problem is the heating of these engines got so hot it was almost it was within a few seconds of melting one of the engine bells and they would have lost the whole ship. Um, so as you can see, this skirt which was supposed to fall off didn't and the plumes that fired that's supposed to separate the skirt burned, burned one of the solar cells off of the, off of the station. So Needless to say, they didn't launch the next day as they had planned. Uh, the, the rumor was we sent some of our defense satellites looking at the space station to see what the damage was. The rumor was those satellites were so precise they could, they could see the, the bolts on the space station. And they saw the condition. And So they had a couple things. You had, we had a power problem because you didn't have enough power to support the, the, the uh, astronauts aboard. And the shield had exposed the skin of the station and it was getting awfully hot. It was getting over 100 degrees within the station. Now fortunately, up at the top of the, where the shield was, there was an airlock where astronauts could put experiments and, and expose them to space to the airlock. They decided they could probably build a parasol that could fit through that airlock and unfurl and be like an umbrella covering the skin of the, of the station. So in a week's time, the seamstresses <coughs> down at Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama designed a couple different shields that they could, parasols that could fold up and they could deploy. So the crew launched on a Saturn 1B up to the space station. They got up there and this is what they saw. You could see where the skin was been peeled off in the, in the sun, the heat has darkened the uh, skin of the station. You can see what's left of the solar panel, you can see the wires, but then you can see the other solar panel here still folded in because a piece of metal from that heat shield had kind of held it to the side, fortunately. So they did an EVA where they depressurized the Apollo spacecraft and they flew around and they reached out and they tried, they tried to pull that solar wing open and it wouldn't budge, it wouldn't budge. So they went ahead and docked to the station, but just like Salyut 1, or Salyut, or Soyuz 11 on Salyut 1, they soft docked, but they couldn't get the hatch, they couldn't get a hard dock, so they had to actually work on the, they, they launched, they tried working, they tried pulling this free, that didn't work, they, they docked, they couldn't open the hatch, so they had to undock and work on the hatch. It was a long, very first day for this crew, but they worked on, they worked on the grapple for the, for the hatch and they were able to dock and they were in, able to enter the sky lab. So one of the first things they did is they went to this airlock and opened up this parasol. And as soon as they did, the temperature started going down in the space station. So that was one problem they had taken care of. Mm -hmm. The other problem, they used, they used like a pruner that you would prune trees with on a long pole. They did a spacewalk. They weren't meant to, to go to this part of the space station, but they had to. And they used this pruner to clip that 
uh, that piece of metal that was holding it closed. And actually, they, they started tumbling after with the, uh, the, the shock of that. But they were able to free that array, and Skylab went on to be successful. So here's just a little tour, if this will play, of Skylab. Skylab, we will never have the space uh, of the Skylab station again, because this was basically a big hydrogen tank that was, wasn't fueled. Uh, that they could they could move and and uh, do experiments and so they had plenty of room as you see them floating now it's interesting these it's hard to see but there's little triangles built in the built into the floor they actually had little triangles on their shoes so they could put their shoes the triangles through the grid and turn them a little bit and they would hold in place so that was one of the things that they did now, that's Joe Kerwin who's going to run into the ceiling here. But uh, uh, they had a lot of fun up on Skylab. They spent 28 days, 54 days, and then 83, I think 83 days up on uh, Skylab. The second group, though, had a problem. Here's, uh, here is the Apollo capsule uh, connected to Skylab. These are uh, thrusters that are used to control the spacecraft to come as it backs away and comes back to Earth. One of them started to leak. One of these quads started to leak. So it's like, okay, we can, we'll turn it off. It's okay. We can, handle, we can handle one quad being off. Well, a few days later, a second quad started to leak. So there was a potential we were going to have astronauts who couldn't get back to Earth because their spacecraft wasn't going to work. Now, they had planned for that. Uh, so uh, Vance Brand and Don Lind, uh, had planned for a Skylab rescue. I talked about that multiple docking adapter. They could have two docked at the same time. So they got ready for this. They, what they would do is they actually, it would be two astronauts instead of three would go up in Skylab. And then where they would normally bring experiments back, they would put two more couches. It would be pretty tight fit, but they would bring five astronauts back at the same time. But Brandon Lynn on simulators back on Earth were able to figure out that you could steer and be able to bring the ship in with just two quads, two of those four quads working. And fortunately, none of the others started to leak, so they stood down and uh, they didn't have to go. Brand finally launched uh, on the Paul Soyuz space flight. Lynn, Lynn didn't get to fly until the space shuttle era. He got to finally fly up into space. But they spent 28, 56 days, 84 days up on Skylab. Um, always like to talk about the uh, shower. They had a shower on Skylab. And what they would do is they would lift, they would lift this piece up to the ceiling, kind of zipper it closed. Then they'd squirt out a little water, and it would float around them. And then they would use a vacuum cleaner to vacuum up the water droplets. But they said by the time it took so long to clean up afterwards, it wasn't worth it. So we really didn't go with a, we really didn't put a shower on any other space station. Uh, what they did love, they had, they had freezers for experiments. Uh, they loved getting ice cream. And so they would throw ice cream in there. And so up on the space station today, anytime a freezer unit goes up, they stick some ice cream in there for the for the astronauts. I think Blue Bunny is their favorite. Um, but it was so large. Here, the they, unit. here they're testing. The Skylab ASMU was the um, closest to the shuttle man mobility unit, unit but was inside not outside the spacecraft. The space the EVAs were conducted with the astronauts attached to life support umbilicals. And, to and I didn't mean to have sound with that, but, but they were able to test this vehicle that they, you know, would eventually on the space shuttle they would fly out the satellites with. It, it didn't turn out to work as well as they thought. But then on the space station they came up with something called safer. If they're on a spacewalk and they get separated or they lose their, their cable, they have something that they can open up that has some handles to, and some jets to get them back. But this was a huge space station to be able to fly within it. Um, they didn't use fuel, they used they use nitrogen, so it, it just went into the atmosphere so it, of the station, so it didn't hurt anything. 
of the unit. Uh, that's Owen Garriott, one of the one of the crew on the uh, on, on Skylab, Skylab uh, the second flight, having uh, having something to eat. Uh, there was uh, spiders. They took spiders up. Do spiders make webs in space? Yeah. After a couple practice ones, they do. Actually, if you go to the Air and Space Museum in Washington, you can see um, Arabella. She's still there. Not, not in good shape, but she's still there. <laughs> All right. This is uh, this is Joe Weitz at the control of that so of those solar telescopes. So they were able to get pictures of solar flares and. Um, they would go out on spacewalks then to bring the film in and bring the film back to Earth. Uh, one interesting fact, I showed you that Gemini spacecraft in the, in, in, uh, earlier that they were going to use for the manned orbiting laboratory. Uh, they needed a hatch for the, uh, for the, uh, to do EVAs. They took a spare Gemini hatch. So there's a little Gemini program on Skylab, even though it was years later it was a hatch to to go out on EVAs to do those spacewalks to get the film. So there was plans to reuse Skylab and the shuttle. One of the first missions of the shuttle was to go up to Skylab, boost it up into orbit, and then we would like to make it a space station, use that, use that space station that we had. So they had, they had uh, put out contracts for the teleoperator retrieval system, which would be carried in the space shuttle, uh, it would fly, the astronauts would fly it to, the, to Skylab, it would dock, and it would power it up into higher orbit, and eventually we would, we would outfit it as the building block for a space station. And Jack Luzma, uh, one of the Skylab astronauts, he was assigned to fly this, he actually flew this, the third shuttle flight, and he was supposed to take that up there. But the sun wasn't kind to Skylab. There's so much solar activity. Skylab uh, fell to Earth in 1979. So who knows what history would have been if we would have had Skylab as the beginning of a space station when the shuttles started flying. Now this is a this is a cool little video. Um, this is rumored to be a Soviet spy satellite capturing the last few orbits of Skylab before it um, before it fell into the atmosphere and burned up. The Russians were very concerned about us going up and stealing their space station, putting it in the cargo bay of a shuttle, if you can believe that. They, uh, they were paranoid about that, and so they were keeping an eye on, uh, on Skylab as well. So you can go to the Air and Space Museum, and they've got a whole Skylab, Skylab B, that never flew. Had they not been able to rescue Skylab from the problems it had, they probably would have flown the Skylab B, but you can actually walk through it, and it's a complete Skylab space station in Washington. All right, we get to the 80s, and uh, we had Space Lab, which isn't really a isn't really a, a space station, but it's a laboratory that was carried in the uh, sh in the uh, shuttle bay. Uh, space Lab, in one configuration or another, flew about 30 times on the space shuttle. And the interesting thing I want to point out is uh, Owen Garriott, who flew on the second Skylab mission, actually got to fly on the first uh, Space Lab mission. Um, but the 80s were really about Mir, the follow-on station to the Salyut stations. So Mir was a big improvement over the Salyut. It was much larger, 12,400 cubic feet, all, you know, four, four and a half, four, four and a half thousand days occupied. So it was really... Um, Joel? Yeah. Sorry. Was this all sent up on one trip? No, no. Okay. No, it was, uh, it was built with several launches, uh, so you can kind of see the modules. And actually, this main module here is one of the bases of the International Space Station for Mir 2 that never got, they never built a Mir 2. They, they ran out of money and uh, joined the International Space Station. Uh, I'll point this module, this is the crystal module. Uh, we actually sent shuttle flights up to Mir, and, and the astronauts spent time on Mir, and they're crew quarters was in this crystal module. 
Uh, so there you see a cosmonaut uh, kind of looking out the window. There's a shuttle docked with Mir. And these are the astronauts who actually spent tours of duty up on the uh, Mir space station. But they had some problems up there on Mir. Um, one of the things they used on Mir was what they called them oxygen candles. It was, they would burn these candles and they would produce oxygen. And each candle, here's, here are these canisters that, are, that we call the candles, each one would produce enough oxygen for one crewman for one day. And often when they would have visitors come up between flights, between missions, like three were going to go home in a couple days, three new ones came up, they would, they would burn extra candles. Well, they went to light one of these candles and it exploded and fire poured out of it about three feet. <clears throat> now, nobody, was, nobody got burned, but the problem is there was a lot of smoke generated by that. And the flame was blocking the exit to one of those Soyuz spacecraft to get home. So they had an emergency, they had an emergency on their hand. You can see where it burned some of the panels here. They said some of the metal was dripping. You could see the candle. What they said, well, they got it back on the ground, and someone you know, they had burned, they had used like 2,500 of these with no problem. But they detected a latex. So somebody's latex glove, some of that latex had rubbed up, rubbed out, and it was enough to cause this thing to fail. Uh, now, most of what they use now are called electron units, which splits water into oxygen. So up on the space station now, we use those electron <laughs> units, but there are still emergency candles, even, even, on, the sp even on the ISS now. If, they, if the electrons have gone down sometimes, and they use those candles, um, but they've improved them since that fire. The other problem they had with an astronaut aboard, um, they kind of caused themselves. Now, space stations since Salyut 6 have been resupplied by Progress Automated uh, Craft. Even the space station now, the ISS, Progress Craft come up and dock, and they use radar, they use, they use these, uh, these dishes here to communicate, and they automatically dock. But they thought, well, we should test to make sure we can manually dock. If something were to go wrong, they call it the KERS docking system. If something were to go wrong, uh, maybe an antenna didn't deploy, which has happened several times, we want to be able to dock these manually. So they had a cosmonaut undock a progress craft that had already been there, and they wanted him to practice docking it manually. Well, he lost, he lost, um, he lost control of the spacecraft. He didn't know where it was. So he backed it up, but he didn't get close to where he needed to go. And this thing came in and hit the space station, punctured a hole in that crystal, um, that, that crystal module that the astronauts were using. Uh, now, they sent the astronaut to the Soyuz. They said, get to the Soyuz before this thing hit, because they thought it, it could have really caused a big problem. But fortunately, they were able to close the hatch to that crystal module and never did find where the leak was. But you can see the damage it did to the solar panels uh, when this thing hit. Um, you know, when you think about it, it probably wasn't the best idea to, to do something like that without really a lot of people paying attention to where this uh, vehicle was. But really, Mir's, Mir was a success and a crowning achievement for, for the Russians. There was talk of keeping it up a little bit longer, uh, but Russia didn't have the money, uh, so it re-entered uh, in 2001. So we get to the 2000s with the International Space Station. The International Space Station began life as Space Station Freedom. Ronald Reagan made a speech, we're gonna build Space Station Freedom, and it looks a lot like, looks a lot like our space station now. Uh, there was one design called the Power Tower, where you'd have all the solar panels at the top, and 
all the modules kind of this way, but they, they, they went with the dual keel system here. Uh, this is the station in 1993. The Zarya, the module, the main module for the space station uh, is Russian. Now the U.S. paid for it, but it was going to be a new mirror, the, the base module for a second mirror. Uh, but they joined the space state. They joined the International Space Station. It's probably good that they did. Uh, we connected it to Unity in 1998, and we built a space station. Big truss that everything was was placed on. Uh, we used Canada Arm 2, which rides a little rail car up and down that truss to position modules or to do work in different areas of the station. You can see the solar panels deploying. It's interesting, um, just this year, we've added solar panels to the International Space Station. They've kind of put them in the middle in between so that they can turn with the, these other panels because these panels follow the sun, so they're always rotating. But to handle the power requirements of the space station, we've had to add, and, and these, um, these panels are much more efficient you know, than these originals. The technology, the solar panel technology has really improved. There's the Destiny Lab, um, uh, the, U, the main US lab was added in 2001. Columbus, which is the European Space Agency lab, added in 2008. Uh, the Japanese added a module, uh, a resupply module on an outside kind of platform for mounting for mounting experiments. And the, and the uh, cupola, uh, used by the astronauts to see uh, rivals and departures from the space station up there. Uh, probably the, where astronauts spend most of their time, up on that space station looking out. That's what an interior of, the, of those modules look like, but pretty soon they fill them up with, uh, with experiments and sleeping quarters and all sorts of things. Uh, in 2016, we sent an inflatable module up. Now, Bigelow built this inflatable. The, the thing about an inflatable, you can, you, it's very small. It's not very big at all. So you can get on a rocket, a smaller rocket, and set it up. But it's even stronger than the materials used on those modules. It uses uh, layers upon layers of, 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 of the same material they use in bulletproof uh, vests. And they have shown these things to be very durable, even from impacts. Uh, you could see there's picture time lapse of them inflating this module on the space station. Now, when they first um, when they first inflated it, NASA had them keep it closed. It's like keep it closed. We're not sure something may puncture it. Um, but after a year, it's like this thing is it's sturdy. There's no problems. And now they use it. They use it for a lot of uh, storage, and it's open all the time. So we're pretty satisfied with the technology of these inflatables, which I think you're going to see on space stations in the future. Uh, there were a few canceled uh, space station, International Space Station modules. There was the uh, science power platform the Russians were supposed to send up, which would have had some solar panels up on, a, uh, on, a, on some girders there and some modules. They, they uh, canceled that. There was going to be a centrifuge module that Japan was working on where they could do science and uh, create artificial gravity. Uh, it's now on display uh, in Japan. And there was, another, there was another living quarters the U.S. was building, but uh, ran into some money issues, so those were never sent up. Also, there was supposed to be an assured crew return vehicle. So if something happened, any astronaut could get in this spacecraft and it would take them home. They wouldn't have to know how to pilot it. It would, it would fly them home. So um, we worked on that, uh, but again, money, money problems prevented that from happening. But the technology went to the X-37B, which is the Air Force's uh, mini shuttle that can stay aloft over two years in, in, in orbit. Uh, and the Dream Chaser, which you're going to see, it's supposed to fly later this year. It might slip into 2024. But it's supposed to resupply the space station, but it's not going to take much to be able to crew this vehicle. To uh, imagine a fleet of these, that would change a lot about access to space if you had a fleet of these Dream Chaser 
mini shuttles. They would actually dock, the docking port would be in the back there. Uh, give you a quick, quick ISS tour. Okay, here we are at the back of the ATV. We're at the very back end of the space station. We're going 18,000 miles an hour in this direction. And so I'm going to kick off and we'll do a quick fly through the stack of the International Space Station. We'll pass some fun things on the way. It's it's large. It's it's actually a lot of space. Not as much volume as, as a Skylab, but a lot of space there. Um, we are planning to deorbit the space station in 2031. Uh, we were going to rely on Russia to send some Progress spacecraft to use their engines to deorbit it. Deorbit it. We're we're planning for Plan B now, and we're coming up with our own module that we can attach that would have engines on it to to deorbit it. But it is a it is a huge vehicle to deorbit, so they'll have to be really careful. Even when they deorbited Skylab, they had a little control over it, but it held together stronger than they had thought, and that's why it hit a little bit of Australia when Skylab uh, crashed back. So hopefully they will get, they will get it in the ocean uh, when they deorbit it in 2031. Because NASA wants to move to other, to other things. They want to move to private space stations that they can rent space on. It's cheaper for them. Uh, and they want to go back to the moon and Mars. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that in a second here. The 2010s were pretty much China as far as space stations go. The uh, Tiangong stations were, looked a lot like uh, the Salyut stations. They could support a crew of three um, for 30 days or so. They had Tiang-1 in 2011. Tiang-2 looked exactly the same as Tiang-1, and it was up from 2016 to 2019. But then they launched the Tiang Station. They, they, they named them all the same, so they're still Tiang. It's Tiang Station, and it's up right now. It's, it's a lot larger, um, and they can, they can resupply it uh, with automated uh, spacecraft. Uh, they uh, can have up to six people on board the station. Here's, a, here's a, one of the crews that's up there on the station. It's 12,000 cubic feet. It's a pretty large station. One of the cool things, it has a little arm on it that helps move the modules around. So it's just a little small arm, but it's able, so somebody can dock, they, they can detach it and move it to the side, so they can expand the station out very, very easily. Uh, so, so that was so kind cool. of a, some cool, cool technology. Like <laughs> now we come to the 2020s, so we're almost done. To the 2020s, what are the stations of the future going to look like? So this is the Lunar Gateway. Um, this is what we're going to use when we go back to the moon. So the thought is, instead of orbiting the moon and then landing, you would fly to a station and then you would board a craft to fly down to the moon. After you spent the time on the moon, you'd fly back to the station and then get in your spaceship to come back to Earth. So that is the point of this Lunar Gateway. Lunar Gateway is not meant to be permanently uh, staffed. It would only be there for, you know, maybe a, you'd spend maybe a couple months aboard and then you would come home. Um, the first module that is supposed to launch next year 
is the, uh, the uh, power module and the basic habitation module. So that, those are the two modules, basically, that, that's going up. It's going to be launched by a, a SpaceX Falcon Heavy uh, spacecraft. So the power pr propulsion and the habitation logistics. Um, it's going to go to an orbit around the moon, a pretty stable orbit, that every two weeks will bring it within a few hundred miles of the moon. So every two weeks would be the time that you would go down and come back up to the to the um, to the space station. Uh, there's proposals to have resupply. Um, here, here's uh, some astronauts on a mock-up of that lunar gateway. Uh, one proposal is a SpaceX Dragon called the Dragon XL that wouldn't come back to Earth. It would fly up to this space station, this lunar gateway station. Actually, they would use some of the room in there. They, would, they were talking about maybe putting a bathroom and things like that in it, but it would bring resupply to that station. Again, this won't be permanently manned like the International Space Station, but uh, we're planning next year to launch the first module there. Um, another station that's, that's I think is really going to happen, uh, because they've actually started turning metal for this thing, is the Axiom Station. Axiom is a company that wants to add some modules to the International Space Station, and then before, when we get ready to deorbit the International Space Station, they will unhook their modules and it'll be, their, it'll be its own space station. So you can see the Axiom modules here connected to the space to the International Space Station to begin with. They start they start with um, a small one in 2024, add additional ones each year. Uh, the last one having power, and then they would be able to detach it and uh, they would rent it. They would rent it to NASA for space to do experiments. They would rent it to companies if they wanted to put their experiments on there to create electronics or drugs or whatever. Uh, and there are some of the components that have been, has been built for the first Axiom module. The Russians have stated they, they want to pull out of the space station even before 2031. Now, they can't really because, uh, you know, we actually paid for the Zarya here. But the Russian segments provide a lot of the propulsion and some of the main systems. Uh, but they're pretty old, and they're starting to have problems. They're starting to have small air leaks and things like that. But what they would like to do, they call it the Orbital Services Station, which will have a uh, inflatable module as part of it that they want to have up by 2027. I don't think it will happen by 2027, but it possibly happen. Um, uh, Jeff Bezos, uh, with his group, have floated the orbital reef station, which would be a station that would, would have 12, uh, 12 people aboard. You could do research. They would rent it out to NASA for space. You could also have tourists go up to this station and spend some time up on the station. Um, some that are a little further out, the Pioneer Station envisions uh, really a hotel up in space where you would take those dream chasers or a Dragon spacecraft, and you'd spend a week up on the space station and come back. And their Voyager station, which, uh, uh, you know, kind of looks like Werner von Braun's original station from the 50s, where you would have, you would have uh, gravity along the wheel because you would spin it. In the center, you would have no gravity, right? And you would have... Um, you would be able to go up there on those Dream Chaser spacecraft. So it's more of a hotel. It's more of a 2001 a Space Odyssey becoming real. And the last one I talk about, there's a Star Lab proposal that the Europeans are working on that would use inflatables too. That uh, uh, there, It's a pretty small station, but they, they would like to get that going in 2027. So International Space Station is not going to make it but a few more years, and then NASA, NASA wants to rent these stations, rent the space. Uh, I think the other thing you'll see in the future are inflatables. Uh, Bigelow has a proposal for a huge inflatable station with several floors. You could 
put those together. He's looking at mainly hotels, but hey, if NASA wants to pay, they want to rent some space, they'll, you know, they'll allow that. And then maybe, in the way in the future, Gerald K. O'Neill's um, version of a space station where humans have to leave Earth because Earth doesn't have the resources for us, so they, they build Earth, really, in a, in a huge space station, uh, which would be cool, uh, maybe someday, maybe someday. <laughs> but uh, that, that is my presentation. I will maybe play this. This kind of compares all the stations. Um, I wish I would have muted this thing. Here we go. I'll let this play as it shows the different space stations, and I'll take questions. Yeah. Two questions, Joel. Number one, the Russians have for decades used the Baikonur Cosmodrome as their launch facilities and so forth, but that's in Kazakhstan, a separate country now. Uh, what do you think it will be the impact on Russia that they're going to have to rent the facilities because they're almost broke now? with uh, their little excursion, shall we say, into a foreign country? Um, in relation to that, apparently the Russians owe $30 million and Kazakhstan is beginning confiscating or taking some things over at the at Cosmodrome. Yeah, they, Russia's actually built a new launch facility. Go figure, it's, it's, the cost has overran and uh, Putin, was, Putin was very mad about how much it cost fired the people in charge just like the U.S. Uh, cost overruns, right? Actually, the first rocket they launched from the new place, they had put the old coordinates coordinates in for Balkanor, and the, the, the rocket didn't even make it into orbit because they hadn't thought that, oh, we switched. We're not where we normally <coughs> launch from. So they do pay some rent, but they're behind. Uh, that's why I really doubt you're going to see, a, you know, if they leave the space station, if they leave the International Space Station, they leave the space station, but I don't see them having the money to build a new one. Also, I've been reading the last couple of days about a new rocket company, and I forgot its name because I'm old, I forget that. <laughs> However, they 3D printed 85% of that rocket, and in the first test, not so successful, but the second one passed through Max Q and continued on, failed to reach orbit, but the fact that it got through Max Q was impressive for the guys who built it. What are your opinions of 3D printing our rocket ships? Yeah, your name of the company is Relativity. Yes, and you're seeing a lot of companies get into the business of these small satellite launchers. Um, that was amazing what they did. Their first real try with this 3D rocket uh, really, it was the second stage that had the problem. I don't think it actually, the engine didn't really light or it kind of spurted. So they got a look at that, but it was very successful for, the, for their first try. You know, SpaceX, when they, when they were working on their first rocket, it failed, it failed, it failed, and uh, Musk got enough money together. It's like, all right, we'll, we'll try one more. And if it had failed, there wouldn't have been a SpaceX at this point. Uh, but it was successful. And uh, SpaceX, as early as Monday, is getting to re ready to do their first test of their big uh, Starship uh, rocket for the first time from, from uh, Boca Chica, Florida. So that'll be, that'll be interesting. But, yeah, it's, if, it'd be great to live down in Florida right now because you would see launches all the time. Uh, in the next few days, there's an Atlas V, one of the last few Atlas Vs launching. There's a Falcon Heavy launching. Uh, and there's another big rocket launching that uh, uh, within the next month or so. A lot of, lot of, you know, back in the 60s, if you look at launch pads and Cape Kennedy and Cape Canaveral, you saw all this activity with military rockets and stuff. And then 70s and 80s, they were all concreted over because nobody was using them. Now they're, everybody and, and their brother is getting into the rocket business and they're building uh, new, new uh, rockets. Yeah. I have a question. Did they consider boosting the space station into a parking orbit as opposed to trying to dunk it in the ocean? Well, the, the, problem, the problem is the modules are really getting old. They're getting past their design life. When they, 
when they launched the International Space Station, when they launched the parts, they put a lot of they put a lot of spare parts on there, like gyros and things. That and some of them they've used, some of them they haven't. But but it's just it's just getting old. It's been up there more than 20 years now. That Russian segment that was for Mir for for the second Mir that wasn't flown, the building block of the station, uh, it's even older than that when they started working on it. I don't know if you saw there was a new Russia seg Russian segment that that docked with the space station last year. And the space station started turning because uh, uh, it was firing its rocket. That was really an old module that they had uh, refurbished, and it, it had problems. So I think the problem is that it's getting old. The technology is getting old. But, but taking it out of service is a different issue than whether or not you scrap all the metal and parts and pieces. Well, if they parked it and just decommissioned it, well, they, somewhere they, down the road, could somebody use some of the pieces and parts well, out they, of it? They, 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 you're still going to have a problem one day where it's going to, anything up in orbit is going to come come back eventually. So if you spend the money, it's going to cost a lot. If we have to, developing that rocket, those rocket engines to bring it down, is going to, it's like a billion dollars. To, to develop that, that we didn't want to have to develop, but we're, we got to do what we got to do, and so to spend that money just to boost it, and that you're going to have to bring it back down eventually, probably not the best idea. I know what you're saying. It's a shame. It's what a facility it is up there, and they're trying to get as much science out of it. It, it really wasn't supposed to go past 2022, 2024, and we've got a, we've hammered out agreements with everybody, but the Russians to extend it to 2030, 2031. But I, I know what you're saying, it seems like a waste. It's just like Mir, Mir was still oper operable. Uh, they were looking for people who would want to run Mir and uh, they didn't find them and it uh, you know, it ended up burning up in the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, returning to relativity and their first launch of Terran 1, a real key element was also that this is I think either the first or second to actually use um, methane as the fuel, which is pretty exciting. Uh, it's believed to have virtues more so than the other the previous uh, previous fuels. That and so is it's true. really better than hypergallic because they're not quite got uh, deadly poisonous. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I did see I did see that there is a proposal requested uh, for SpaceX to try to boost the station. To your point, uh, but they just started. They just started. They've to talked build. about it. They don't know if the if they may have to build like a dragon and strip it down. And add, because the station isn't really meant to have to have a you know. There's a lot of things. Even when it started spinning, it's like the the mission. The guy in mission control said, "I didn't know whether it was going to be in one piece after it started spinning just a few months ago because it's not really designed for that." But we over-design a lot of stuff, and it, it it's usually a little sturdier than than we think it's going to be. So every now and then they have to move the space station to avoid debris and other things. How the heck do they do that? Are they are they tracking the zillion pieces they, of stuff? NORAD, just like they track Santa, they yes. track <laughs> the smallest screws. Like now you can't track everything uh -huh. because look at that Soyuz that was attached to the space station that started having a fuel leak, yeah. and they had to send up an unmanned one to bring that crew home. It actually flew back. Uh, they said it got pretty hot when they measured the temperature, so you, you wouldn't want people on it. But it got hit by something. It, it really, we think it got hit by a micrometeorite or could have been a piece of space junk. The, that main, that, that the Mir 2 that I keep talking about, that main module, now it gets resupplied <coughs> with fuel from those progress, unmanned progress craft, and so they, it has engines on it. It's funny to watch the astronauts on the space station. Whenever they have a firing, they like to have the camera on because the station moves and they stay still. You know, so they run into the wall or the ceiling whenever they do an uh, engine burn on that. Okay, just quick follow up. So, what size object is is a fatal? W what is the problem? Well, you get you get hit somewhere where you, you get you get hit. There's probably small places that if you get hit, it could be catastrophic. Yeah. Now. 
Like, when the mirror got hit by that progress they were trying to dock, and they had an air leak, they were able to close a hatch. Now, there are hatches all over the station where they could basically, they have a lot of oxygen, they, uh, like vents yeah. going in modules to modules. They can pull those, and there's actually knives right there that they can cut that. They'll cut the cables, they'll cut anything to close that hatch. So you could seal off. They've had leaks on the International Space Station where they've really they've sealed off a section to try to locate the leak. They even had on the mirror when they had that leak in the crystal module, they did an inter-vehicle spacewalk. You think of extra vehicle, enter. So they put spacesuits on, depressurized part of the station, went in there, tried to find the leak, couldn't find the leak on the crystal. The crystal was never used again. Um, but it, it could be really serious. That's why you've you got to have a way to get home. The thing with the Soyuz, which is what we use right now for the lifeboats, the couches in there are made for astronauts. So they, when this problem happened on the Soyuz, they had the coolant leak. They said, well, why don't you send a dragon up there to bring those astronauts home? <clears throat> Dragons not, they, they have special uh, uh, suits that plug into their couches. I mean, it's, you're, you're, they're they're not um, they're not universal seats, so you know I I think like that fire aboard Mir. I think if worse came to worse, hey guys, we're cramming in this one. It's better than dying up here. We're all gonna we're gonna we'll do our best. You know we may get hurt on the way down, but uh, you know this it's it's dangerous. You know anytime anybody goes up into space. It's dangerous. At least the space station in Earth orbit, you're, you're just a couple hours away from home. Talk about the lunar gateway, you are not a couple hours from home. You're, you're, you're a few days away from home if there were an emergency. Um, they are equipped to do basic um, medical procedures up on the space station. They always have somebody trained, but there could be life, you know, life, uh, endangering issues where they got to get them back and they, they got to try to get them home. That's the problem with going to Mars and stuff too when you're talking about going out on a, even a month's journey you know that we hope we can get to at some point and you get a problem on day two and you can't turn around and come home so it's, it's dangerous yeah. yeah so it's just going to follow up more with the space junk that seems to be becoming a bigger issue it has hit the International Space Station and and impact all these future stations too. Yeah, it, there are a lot of companies that are working on ways to clean up the space junk, whether you harpoon it or you get it in a, imagine some kind of a net. It is, it is, um, it's a tough problem to figure out. You know, most things will burn up. You know, you, you hear of an astronaut dropping a tool and they can follow that, a bag of tool, they can, they can track that and usually a few days later, it, it burns up in the atmosphere. They've even discarded things. They've gone up to the Hubble and discarded a solar panel and you know they could track it and, it and it burns up. But there are things that they don't know are up there besides just you know material from, from space that's up there that could hit too that they're, they're, they're not tracking. You know? So it's, uh, it is a problem. They need to come up with a solution for it. Wasn't last year or the year before there an issue with something about sabotage of someone who was punching a hole in one of these uh, or the space stations? They had a leak. They had a leak in the Soyuz. It almost as somebody, almost as somebody drilled, started to drill to mount something, and oh, i in the wrong spot, and they drilled somewhere else. And the rumor was the Russians were saying it was it was an American astronaut who had who had intentionally done that. I mean. That's laughable. You know, for all the relation, for all the issues with Russia right now, those crews work together and work really well. You saw that tour of the space station. You saw that Russian um, having some fun with with him, kind of holding him back. They they work well. They work well together, and they they do their best not to let really government relations um, have an effect on on the crew. Um, so yeah, no, we we did not drill a hole. We uh, we think what really think happened is somebody made a mistake in Russia and then they tried to hide it. Um, 
by putting some patch over it, which didn't didn't hold very well. But yeah. I just wanted to point out for any uh, space tourists there, if you go up to the Wisconsin Dells, there's a mirror module that you can walk through because Tommy Bartlett bought it surplus from okay. Russia and. Uh, it's nicely fitted out, and you can you can feel what the size of it's like and all. Cause you can yeah, the all Kansas things. Cosmodrome has some of the Russian um, um, modules and, and spacesuits and things like that. It's, it's kind of cool. I, I, Tommy Bartlett, I didn't know yep. if that was still there. <laughs> it's still there, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I was going to say, if you're ever in Huntsville, Alabama, the Space and Rocket Center there has um, both an ISS mock-up that you can walk through and a big display with it, and a Skylab mock-up. Yeah, and, and of course a couple Saturn Vs. And in Huntsville, like that, so. they uh, they have a big water tank where they practice uh, EVAs, and they would have they would put the Skylab when when they had that problem with the with the solar panel. They did some pra they had a week. They did some practice there on how to how to get to that area of the space station that they didn't Skylab wasn't designed for you to go walking down the side and freeing a solar panel. The International Space Station, it's got handrails all over the place. And plus, it's got that arm mounted on the trolley that rides that truss. So you can get to a lot of places on, on the ISS. They were unfurling one of the solar panels on the ISS once, if you guys remember. And it, it ripped as they were rolling it out. It ripped. So they put an astronaut on a boom to kind of sew it together. It's kind of cool that they were able to do that because they had the capability. But the, the, uh, another problem with, with the space station, the fact that we can't reuse it, we don't have a truck anymore. We have a space shuttle that you could pull up and you could work on the Hubble. You could. Do, we don't have that capability anymore. It, it, uh, we'll be lucky to do a spacewalk out of an Orion uh, capsule because it's not meant to do that. Um, but um, speaking of that, SpaceX is actually a private crew is looking at maybe going to the Hubble with a Dragon and refurbishing the Hubble uh, to have it go a few more years. That's kind of cool. Yeah, I was going to say one other place to visit is the Air Force Museum because they have a, a shuttle there. And I was amazed how big that was. I had no idea. I thought they were really small. Yeah, that, that mirror, that uh, Gemini B that I showed you, it is in the Air Force Museum. It's, it's not a far drive uh, no. in, in Ohio. Um, and, yeah, and it's, uh, it's, I mean, if you're interested in aircraft and stuff, it is, um, it is amazing. Of course, it's the, one of the first ones here. But they, <laughs> but they, have, um, they have that Gemini B that they were going to use for the Man Orbiting Laboratory which actually was the second Gemini flown. It was an unmanned test of Gemini before they put crew on it, but they refurbished it. They made the heat shield a little larger because this manned orbiting laboratory was going to be in a polar orbit, so it could fly over all the areas of the Earth and, and those astronauts could take the pictures. You know, they told the astronauts, they didn't tell them what they would be doing. They knew they'd be doing military experiments, but they didn't tell them until they, till they said, okay, you are a mole astronaut. You're gonna really you're gonna take pictures and things. Like, and if you have any problem with that, you can you can say now and, and, and leave. Now, of course, after you've been selected as an astronaut, are you really gonna leave after they told you what what it really was? Richard Truly, one of those astronauts who later became uh, he flew the shuttle and he actually became the administrator of NASA. He said it was amazing that we really had two space programs back in the '60s. You had the NASA program. And you had the military program that was completely, completely different. Robert Crippen, who flew on the first space shuttle flight with John Young, he was one of those small astronauts too, who became, um, he became the uh, head of Kennedy Space Center a few years ago. Any other questions? Yeah. Is anybody actually working on a uh, space station that rotates to create gravity? Well, some of those at the end. Some uh, the. Um, let me see here. This Voyager station and this Pioneer would be uh, would be rotated, especially the Voyager. Um, there's a there's some good research on how fast you rotate because 
you know, you want to create the Earth gravity, but if you spin a lot of movies out and spin them really fast, it's like no way. You, there's no way you could even stay together if you spun that fast. A lot of the stations uh, they thought about in the 60s had two uh, um, two wheels. With the thought is, if you had a problem in one, you you could maybe get to the other one and and save yourself, kind of a thing. But um, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, they didn't know whether space could kill you. They didn't, they didn't know. They spit, sent chimps up because they didn't know what weightlessness would do, prolong weightlessness. So that's why there was a lot of thought of, you want to have some gravity. Um, there was a concept for Skylab B, if they had launched it, to even spin Skylab. And actually, when it fell back to Earth, you could have spun it. It held together pretty well. Um, but uh, I think when you talk about space hotels and things like that, that's because re really, we go into space to do things in a, in, with no gravity. You know, that's, that's the unique thing about space. Do you know if that's a consortium that's running this Voyager one? I hadn't heard of this one. Most of the other ones I've heard of, but this one? Yeah, that's, I included them. Like Elon Musk, they have a lot of, uh, they, they have a, a lot of good ideas and thoughts, but I don't know, they haven't actually turned any metal. It, it, it would cost a lot, but you know, uh, just looking at um, the Falcon 9, they, I think they've landed 180 something times already um, and reused those spacecraft. They had a problem, they got a, they were counting down last week, they got to three seconds and they had to pause and that was a, that was a ship that had only been flown, that was the second flight, you know. Most of these things have proven themselves and by reusing, reusing these rockets you can get a lot of payload and if that starship it is kind of crazy when you think about it. Reusing a first stage and a second stage, catching, catching them on the launch pad, putting them down, refueling them, going again. And if they can do that, that will really open up how much material we can get into <coughs> space. You know that Starship, NASA has hired that Starship to be the landing vehicle to land astronauts on the moon. Um, but, uh, so I hope I hope everything goes well. I would expect some delays, so. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you for, I know it's a long presentation. Thank you for your...